Hello everyone, Hello from Malaysia. Welcome to the fifth program of Biosafety and Biosecurity Month, October 2020. A month to raise biosafety and biosecurity awareness. And thank you very much for your participation today. You have joined our webinar on post-COVID-19 biosafety protocols in dentistry. And we'll begin our program shortly. I'd like to kick off today's program by reminding you how some of the housekeeping items as seen on the screen. First of all, please turn off your microphone during the session and only unmute when you are required to speak. Please turn on your camera so that we can see one another. If you have any question or comment, please feel free to message us on the chat box. We will try our best to address your concerns. The chat box is also there for you to introduce yourself. Please give us your name and organization. Last but not least, no phone calls or disruptions during the session. And note that this session will be recorded and live on YouTube, and the recording will be saved on our YouTube channel. An evaluation survey will appear at the end of our session. Please spend some time to provide your feedback as it will be really meaningful for us to improve our next session. Thank you very much for your attention. And once again, welcome all to our fifth webinar organized by AIDS Institutional Biosafety Committee as part of October 2020. Biosafety and Biosecurity Month at Ames University. My name is Fadla Safarudin. I am a biotechnology final year student at Ames University, and it's my absolute honor to serve as your MC for this webinar. If anyone has any issue with audio or video, please use the chat box and we'll do our best to help you. Without further ado, let's begin the session. With a welcome note by Ames IBC Chairman, Senior Associate Professor Dr. Subash about Biosafety and Biosecurity Month at Ames University. Dr. Subash, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fazla. Uh, very good morning to all the participants, those are in uh, virtual room. First, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for making a time to attend this uh, webinar. I hope uh, all of your family members, friends, loved ones are safe and in good health because we are going in, uh, going through a difficult time. The, I mean, uh, sorry, AIMS University is observing October 2020 as Biosafety and Biosecurity Month. The main aim of this Biosafety and Biosecurity Month is to raise the awareness about uh, Biosafety and Biosecurity and uh, as a part of this Biosafety and Biosecurity Month, to promote it, we have organized nine webinars. Uh, we have added another two. So that means we have organized 11 webinars and a poster presentation competition. I strongly believe that uh, all these programs which we have organized will help the participants to uh, raise their awareness about Biosafety and Biosecurity. And uh, today's webinar is webinar number five. We have around 200 registered participants from eight countries. I'm delighted to see all these uh, responses from various countries. Uh, we have participants from Malaysia. We have participants from Algeria. We have participants from Indonesia, Libya, India, Nepal, Vietnam, as well as some participants from United States of America. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, senior management of AMC University for their full support to implement this Biosafety and Biosecurity Month because without their support, uh, it's not possible. I also want to record my thanks to all the members of Institutional Biosafety Committee members for their support to implement this Biosafety and Biosecurity Month Today, we have a wonderful speaker, Dr. Vidovati. I want to thank uh, Dr. Vidovati for accepting the invitation and becoming a part of this Biosafety and Biosecurity Month webinar series. I also want to uh, thank uh, especially uh, Dr. Susan Kelly, uh, because, because she's from different zone. It's uh, around 8 p.m. in uh, United States of America, and it's a Sunday. So uh, thank you, Susan, for joining us. A uh, little bit about uh, Dr. Susan Kelly. 
Dr. Susan carries a bachelor's degree in uh, organizational uh, psychology from Purdue University. She has a doctorate in uh, veterinary medicine from the University of California at Davis. She earned a postdoctoral master in comparative pathology while conducting vaccine research at California National Primate Research Center. Currently, she is a principal member of the technical staff for the Global Chemical and Biological Security Group at National, uh, sorry, Sandia National Laboratories, United States of America. Her life, she has a passion, hence her life's work focuses on whole of government approaches to chemical, biological, as well as radiological safety and security. She was carefully chosen to serve as a consultant on various United States federal government's projects over the past decade due to her extensive experience and wisdom in clinical practice, diagnostic laboratories, research laboratories, and response. She is a member of the Pi Beta Kappa National and uh, Golden Key International Honor Societies. So uh, I'm uh, very happy we have a wonderful moderator today. Dr. Susan, thank you very much for joining us for our Biosafety and Biosecurity Month webinar series. And thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Last but not least, I want to take this opportunity to record my special thanks to uh, biotechnology students of Ames University. They are doing a wonderful job. Uh, they are helping me and uh, Institutional Biosafety Committee uh, to uh, uh, put in the place all the logistics and uh, 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 implement biosafety and biosecurity uh, month activities. So once again, thank you all of you. And uh, please, uh, Pazla, lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subash, for your welcoming remark. Now I request moderator of the webinar, Ms. Susan Kelly, to introduce the speaker and start the session. And over to you, Ms. Susan. Thank you so much. I appreciate the fact that you have invited me to this very important webinar series. I want to thank Amst University for being proactive about biosecurity and biosafety, and Dr. Subash for reaching out to me to be a part of this tonight. I know that COVID-19 has changed a lot of what we do. Our schedules every day are different at home and at work because of the virus. I know that in the United States, it's very difficult for us to look after the things that we normally would take care of, like people who take care of our eyesight and people who take care of our oral health. It is very difficult to receive those services right now. Most people, think of dental health in terms of worrying about severe cavities or an abscess tooth, some sort of emergency situation that makes you really want to visit your dental professional for relief. And though these are important factors in dental health, they're not the complete story. It turns out that there are many, many effects of dental health that occur even when there's just mild conditions in the mouth that are not healthy. We now know that the bacteria in the mouth and their byproducts have access to the bloodstream. Because of this, there can be follow-on effects, such as bacteria making their way towards the valves of the heart, creating a lesion, lesion we call a vegetative lesion. This can cause dysfunction of the heart itself and take some time for people to figure out why that dysfunction is occurring. Because of this, there is a little bit of delay in getting that infection treated. And unfortunately, scar tissue can form on the valve of the heart, causing a dysfunction of the heart itself, which over time can cause heart failure, which as you can imagine, affects both the quality and the quantity of someone's life. In addition, we now know that the bacteria and the byproducts having access to the bloodstream can have an effect on things like the brain. We now know that some people have cognitive dysfunction 
in their later years of life, partly due to poor oral health over years of their later life. And so it is extremely important that we take care of our dental health proactively and get to those appointments in spite of the fact that we have COVID-19 present in our societies right now. Unfortunately, because of a fear of the virus, some people are avoiding these critical appointments. And that leads them to wait until severe conditions have set in before they see their dental professional. Sadly, they may be seeing them in an emergency situation. They may also be seeing them at exactly the same time in which they could have the virus present in their system, whether they know it or not, since asymptomatic infections are extremely common. Therefore, dental professionals are actually facing a very difficult situation. And that is that people who probably have or possibly have virus in their mouth are now needing a professional to become very close to them. And there's no mask on the patient. Add to that that because they have waited to see their dental professional, they probably need extensive treatment, which has the opportunity to create aerosols in that dental space, which as you can imagine, is a very risky situation for the dental professional. And so even if those of you who are joining us today are not dental professionals yourself, you know that you are at risk of being exposed to aerosols containing COVID-19 because of the types of procedures you probably do, whether you work around people who may be coughing, whether you intubate individuals, whether you handle patient samples that have come out of a centrifuge, all of these things involve aerosols. And so if you'd like to know how to protect yourself and what to worry about in situations where COVID-19 might be present, especially high-risk situations like those, I can't think of a better person to ask than Dr. Witawati. Dr. Witawati with Jackson O is our speaker today. She has an extensive history in education in dental health and procedures related to dental health. She received her doctorate in dental surgery originally from Yerlonga University. She went on to add to that an extraordinary PhD in clinical dentistry from Hiroshima University in Japan. After that, she became a senior lecturer at the University of Science Malaysia Health Campus and then was awarded the position of Deputy Dean for Research and Postgraduate Study at Kulia of Dentistry, International Islamic University Malaysia in 2010. She became a full professor of periodontics in the Faculty of Dentistry, Lincoln College, Malaysia, and then went on to become an associate professor right now in the Faculty of Dentistry at Amst University. I would like to point out to you that in addition to all of this educational effort that she has put in, throughout this time, she has served on many committees and boards at which time people referred to her by various terms such as chairman or judge. And what that means is that when Dr. Widowati speaks, people listen. And today she has important lessons to tell us about COVID-19 and dental procedures. So please give her your full attention. Dr. Widowati, go ahead. Dr. Vidovati, your, your mic is muted, Dr. Vidovati. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for giving me chance to present on this occasion. Actually, when this chance came to me automatically, I give title to the chairman of this program, Dr. Subhas, only biosafety protocols in dentistry. Due, this is a month of biosafety and biosecurity. However, don't forget, within this month, we have to deal with COVID-19 as well. And COVID-19 pandemic is a recent example of a threat 
which has needed to engage biosecurity in all countries of the world. So I changed to the title by adding post-COVID-19. So full title become post-COVID-19 Biosafety Protocol in Dentistry. Um, okay, before starting, let me to say hello to all of you from many countries. Welcome to our sessions. I know many participants, uh, my colleagues join here, not only from Malaysia, but also including from Indonesia, uh, Nigeria, and so on. And this activity is motored by the Faculty of Applied Sciences, Ames University, and I, as a lecturer in dentistry, participated in this uh, program. So, um, even for today, my moderator is from USA. It is already night now, even though not too late. She told me not too late, yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome and to support us, uh, Dr. Susanne, and thank you to make me proud. Thank you so much. So I can share my, uh, Okay, share screen, okay. Okay, for a while I... Um. So, can you see my uh, slide, everybody? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. yes okay. Thank you. Um, so, this is my title, and I give a bit red lining, showing that actually we give more attention to the biosafety protocols in dentistry. Um, I know before this, uh, speakers has already explained about biosafety and biosecurity, but this time I'd like to explain the term, this term, biosafety and biosecurity in relation to dentistry. Actually, this term, biosafety and biosecurity, not so popular within uh, or familiar in dentistry, especially in clinical dentistry. It can be more familiar with laboratory works. And this term, I think, become uh, so popular within last two decades. Uh, concepts of biosafety and biosecurity deal with uh, Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. If you go. Mm. Concept of biosafety and biosecurity deal with related but distinctly different issues. Biosafety is derived from the practical guidance issued by the World Health Organization on techniques for use in laboratories. The WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual or LBM considers biosafety to be the containment principles, technologies and practices that are implemented to prevent unintentional exposure to pathogens and toxins or their accidental release. The term biosecurity is more complex as it can have different meanings in different contexts. According to the relevant WHO guidance, the phrase has evolved simultaneously in various processes and is used differently in each. Over the years, that there has been confusion 
between the term biosecurity and biosafety, especially in Europe. Um, in France and German, there is only one word, biosecurity, to cover both words used in English. The term includes biological threats to people, including from pandemic diseases and bioterrorism. About bioterrorism, I think already explained by the first speaker, maybe on 7 October, uh, Prof. Badrul. He actually marched because he is military. He already explained about uh, bioterrorism. Okay. Now we come to the infection control. Actually, this term is more commonly used in dentistry because it has been a long time in our world, probably since the founding of dentistry. As for the term biosafety and biosecurity, relatively new, uh, relatively new, as I told you, perhaps around this last two decades, especially in the field of laboratory works. Okay, and infection control refers to policies and procedures used to minimize uh, the risk of spreading infections, especially in hospitals and humans or animal health care facilities. It can, uh, including infection control matter host and infection control policy. Infection control procedures arrest transmissions of diseases by using different methods such as physical barriers, chemical agents, and heat. As for infection control policy, is an equally important aspect of this working environment. As a starting point, all dental practices should have an infection control policy in place, which must be managed, implemented, and reviewed on a regular basis. And infection control needs to include all aspects of the running of a dental practice. We have to learn how to better protect ourselves, dentists, oral physicians, including your patients from infection transmissions in the dental setting. And infection control has become a formal discipline in the United States since uh, the 1950s due to the spread of staphylococcal infections in hospitals. Uh, the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Infection, then issued new guidelines and uh, around 2003, maybe before this, they already uh, published new guidelines maybe, yeah? For the proper maintenance and sterilizations of dental equipment, hand hygiene for dentists and dental hygienists, dental radiology, medications, oral surgery, environmental infection control, and standards for dental laboratories. Then, um, there is a guideline on infection control in dental practice uh, that is um, endorsed by MDC, MDC Malaysian Dental Council on 22 February 2017. This is third edition. Now we come to the biosafety and in dental care, biosafety in dental care, including sterilizations of dental instruments and also infection preventions, an emerging topic of importance. Sterilizations in dental instruments, such as patient care items, in example, dental instruments, devices, and equipment are categorized as critical, semi-critical, or non-critical, depending on the potential risk for infection associated with their intended use. Then um, infection prevention, an emerging, an emerging topic 
of importance uh, gave uh, more attention to the preventions of cross transmission that are common practice in many countries. Okay. Then we will talk a bit about COVID-19 because in my title also I include the COVID-19. The COVID-19 is a viral infection caused by, by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. It is identified in December 2019 in Wuhan city, China. China. It become rapidly evolving and spreading it was characterized in January 2020 as a public health emergency by the World Health Organization or WHO. Then in March 2020, yeah, we all remember, yeah. I'm sure we all remember from medical and dental. It was declared a global pandemic outbreak affecting 170 regions and countries with more than 400,000 confirmed cases. Actually, this is very surprising us, even shocking us. So in the sad situations, some of us, even many maybe, because I just find this a picture, they make, um, sad joke. I think this is a sad joke by showing how we can treat the patients safely. We should maybe by joke they said oh we should have to use uh, long sticks or even long pipe to avoid oral cavity of the patients. I can understand that time we we are become shocking because this is new. And then uh, again, there was many standard personal protective equipment in all major, yeah, in all uh, subjects from A to E level and already explained by the previous speakers. But I would like to give um, more impressions in dentistry. This is ideal standard PPE in dentistry. You see, not only oral physician, not only dentists have to use this. Patient, sometimes they ask cynicism, mm, you protect yourself, how about the patients? But actually not that, actually not like that. We also think about protected protecting the patients. Then after working hours, breaking time, also we have to wrap clinic, yeah? equipment in clinic, including dental chairs, all, all computer, uh, like computer, all. Okay. Then the transmissions model of the novel coronavirus and its high virulence involve direct and indirect human contagiousness by proximity, potentially spreading through saliva and respiratory fluids. During the pandemic, most health teams, especially in the medical field, acquired the disease during the care of infected individuals. Uh, in dentistry, there is a considerable occupational risk given the nature of procedures performed on an outpatient setting, making patient care a potential challenge in coping with this disease. And dental practice involves procedures with great physical proximity between professional and patient associated with the generations of aerosols that culminate in water, saliva, and blood droplets and pathogenic microorganisms. There is studies have demonstrated the role of the oral mucosa and COVID-19 infection in addition 
to expressing the AC2 receptor in saliva glands in the asymptomatic process in infected saliva, thus being one of the main sources of viruses and contaminated surfaces in the workplace perpetuate the virus survival for up to five days. Yeah. And there are still no studies assessing the risk of SARS-CoV-2 transmission during dental care or determining the descriptions of the risk for the dental team regarding exposure and risk of cross contaminations. Considering that dentistry has particularities related to the behavioral approach strategies and active participation participations of patients and caregivers, the institutions of new guidelines is necessary and should be aimed at preventing and minimizing potential risk for both professionals and patients and caregivers during and after the coronavirus pandemic. Sorry for this uh, uh, gadget disturbing Um This is a positive COVID-19 in Malaysia based on state. I take this data as of October 14 at 12 noon. Uh, actually, every two or five days, it did become the amount of COVID-19 infected persons become increase and increase. But I take only until uh, 14, yeah, to the, um, five days ago. This on 14, there is a 660 new cases have been reported. This makes the number of COVID-19 positive case in Malaysia, as many as 17,540. It is per 14. I'm sure today may be become 18,000 or 19,000. Yep. Therefore, the number of active incidents with COVID-19 infections that time is uh, around 5,768. Active incidents in COVID means that patient should be hospitalized to the ICU and usually they need respiratory assistance, either ventilator or intubations. They have been excited and given treatment. This is uh, data in Malaysia. Then, with the conviction that access to information and knowledge sharing are the best tools for changing behavior and attitudes and based on the relevant literature published, this review aims to present information that can improve good practice in health and consequent minimizations of operational risk in a dental practice. At this time, I give more attention, impressions or emphasize in screening and airflow or air circulations. Few days, uh, Friday maybe, Dr. Parasuraman gave you uh, more details on microorganisms either bacteria and virus. This time I give more uh, impression in this screening and airflow, especially I take from um, my office, my own building. This is scientific evidence and decision making. The typical clinical symptoms manifested in patients affected by COVID-19 are dry cough, as you know, fever, myalgia, or fatigue, difficulty breathing, and in some cases, diarrhea. Partial or total loss of smell, such as hyposmia or anosmia, and taste change can be 
dysgeusia, hypogeusia, or agusia, also stena. These prodromal signs can progress to severe pneumonia with multiple organ failure. However, mortality rates are predominantly observed um, in elderly patients and in the presence of pre-existing comorbidities such as cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, and including cancer. And most children have a benign course of the disease with mild respiratory symptoms and low frequency of death, making it difficult to estimate the true incidence of the virus in these individual, in these individuals in children, below expected rates in children affected by COVID-19 may be related to decreased exposure and infections by the virus and by immunity to other coronaviruses. Consequently, decreasing the likelihood of developing the disease even when infected. Uh, Drugs such as chloroquine and its hydroxychloroquine analog used in the treatment of autoimmune diseases have antiviral properties and immunomodulatory effects. However, till now, there is absence of conclusive clinical trials rules out, at least till this moment, and their use in patients with COVID-19. To date, scientific evidence shows that COVID-19 virus can be spread through aerosols, but given the genetic nature of the virus is almost identical to coronavirus, the possibility of airborne transmissions in the form of aerosols and respiratory drops is also high. The delivery of dental surfaces also involves many treatment procedures that produce aerosols and respiratory droplets mixed with saliva and blood that can contain the virus. These aerosols and respiratory droplets are micro-sized and may remain in the air for a long time, thus may potentially infect other exposed individuals. And the spread of this outbreak also affects dental surfaces as the facilities and the delivery of dental surfaces are constantly exposed to the risk of cross-infection between patients and dental staff. Now we come to the aerosol control. There are around 38 types of microorganisms in the air in a dental office, including Legionella, Pneumophila, the causative agents of severe pneumonia. And several studies have shown that many dental procedures produce contaminated aerosols and droplets remain in the environment for a considerable length of time. There's another study uh, showed that COVID-19 is transmitted through the air when an infected individual coughs, laughs, sneezes, and speaks to a susceptible individual in close physical proximity. Yeah. Uh, before uh, Dr. Susanna also told this, yeah. And therefore, disease propagation is the most important concern in clinics and hospitals because it is difficult to avoid the generations of large amounts of droplets and aerosols mixed with the patient's saliva and even blood during dental practice. And dental instruments such as high-speed hand pieces, as you know, we always, uh, most of the time, drill the patients. Use aerosol oil to make the turbine rotate at high speed and run under running water. An aerosol, means like a uh, aerosolution is a suspension of fine solid particles 
or liquid droplets in air or another gas and aerosols can be natural or anthropogenic. The particles general, uh, the particles generated are also small, then they are able to remain in the air for a long period of time before depositing on environmental surfaces or in the respiratory tract. Therefore, COVID-19 has the potential to spread through aerosols, again, especially in dentistry, from infected people. And several health institutions have recommended that rotating instruments be used as little as possible. Rotating instruments, it means we have to reduce to drill the tooth of the patients. And dental clinic surgeries may present a high risk of contamination and can act as a breeding ground for the varied microorganisms present in the patient's oral cavity. This highlights the need for a survey focused specifically on dentistry for possible discussion of the subjects by educators, other professionals, undergraduates, and employees in the area. Thus, the evaluations of the disseminations and applications of biosafety information in dentistry regarding the protections of AIDS professionals and staff, practical implementations of the biosafety principles, learn and eliminations of residues among others are subjects of constant interest and debate in the scientific and dentistry communities. Then we come to the clinical protocols. It is important to point out that protection protocol measures should not only involve the personnel who provide dental care, but also the patients to reduce cross contagion. Yeah, I told in the previous slide, yeah, with the PPE, ideal PPE. And there is um, table one for consulting dental care guidelines. This is biosafety protocols against COVID-19. This institutional agency also referred by um, developing country, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on. But of course, because of uh, mm, yeah, language, language problem, most of us, refer to the World Health Organization, yeah, USA, World Dental Federation, FDI with red color, and American Dental Associations or, or ADA, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. All is based on uh, institutional aid USA. But as you know, our country, Malaysia and Indonesia, not too worse if we comparing with the USA. Yeah. So uh, even we feel sad, but no need to feel too much sad. Why? Because even USA also, uh, I believe it is high presentations of infect COVID-19 uh, infected. Yeah? And clinical protocols are didactically, uh, didactically divided into four distinct moments of dental care, such as patient screening, pre-operative, operative, and post-operative periods. And when possible, elective treatments should be avoided. Yeah? And prioritizing urgent procedures, such as pain, edema, hemorrhage, and dental alveolar trauma. In addition, considering that most patients may be asymptomatic, slightly symptomatic, or at the incubation period between one to 14 days, 
So all patients should be treated as if they are contaminated. This is the problem, yeah? And therefore, in view of the specificities inherent to the activity, dentistry has discussed infection control strategies and flow charts and safety recommendations aimed at resuming clinical care. So later, uh, Faculty of Dentistry, Ames University, my office, enhanced infection control protocol post COVID-19 to reduce risk of COVID-19 transmissions in 5th June, 2020. Actually, this is a very complete and quite uh, good, quite very good, yeah. Uh, and it gives more emphasis on patient screening and flow chart uh, during uh, infection control during pandemic. So we think also about the biosecurity or biosafety and biosecurity in our environment. This is that guidebook. That time, the Faculty of Dentistry has formed the Post-COVID-19 Enhanced Clinical Infection Control Committee prior to reopening of dental clinic because after that accident on March be become sets and can could not do anything. But fortunately, uh, Dean and this Dean staff designed and worked on uh, this book. So all was designed and worked on faculty leaders, especially Dean and Dean staff, consists of these persons. Then we come to the, okay, we come to the guidance in patient screening and triage at FOD, FOD Faculty of Dentistry, Ames University. Yeah? It is placed in ground floor at the entrance to dental center. So this is ground floor. Okay. Um, I hope by showing this place, it's not a bad influence on the uh, biosafety and biosecurity security around this place. Sure, should be better. Boss, I'm sure. Um, when we do on a triage, we mentioned this as a triage. Yeah? This is layout. This is actual uh, photograph. All patients need to be screened at the first point of contact and requesting patients to declare symptoms, travel, or contact with a confirmed case. Then we have to prevent patients from bringing companions to their appointment. For a child patients or those who require assistance, only one companion is allowed. And patients should be offered three-ply surgical masks. We also uh, prepare hand sanitizer here to be used and have disposable wipes for nasal hygiene in case it needs. So this is layout, this is lift, and this is staircase. We are separate uh, patients and visitors in this way for student and staff. So this is uh, our efforts to make uh, safe the environment. Then uh, full gown and uh, mask uh, used by staff, hand hygiene before and after each patient must be used. And it is patient screened by staff and should be uh, prevent distance from patients uh, more than one meter, at least one meter. Then this person use a thermal screening and social distancing 
while waiting for screening also to be prevented. Health declarations form either by online or paper-based system should be filled in by the visitors, patients, and including our staff. Then what question should be asked to the patients? A, travel history or social gathering. And number two, B, whether the patient well or unwell. If the patient feel unwell, then the question should be more details. And another question we have to ask recent contact if there is any recent contact with any uh, person under investigations or under therapy for COVID-19. If all questions respond positive and high temperature means above 37.8, we have to arrange for reappointment for at least 14 days later. Sometimes we feel uh, not sure actually when welcome the patient like this, respond positive, arrange for reappointment because patient not feel happy of course, but if we're not sure, we also prepare uh, the guideline, many appendix here, maybe three or four. If we feel uneasy, then we can check from that guidance. And sometimes even patients, if uh, want to see this, we can show it. And should remember that all environments should be well and ventilated, sanitized, uh, patient meeting should be seating rearranged and remind to all patients and also staff to wash hands each uh, stipulated time. Then uh, we use also this table to make uh, to classify uh, infectious risk status. There are three point low, medium, and high risk. Low risk if there are no sign or symptoms of COVID-19 infection, no history of travel to the country suffering from the COVID-19, no history of close contact with COVID-19 positive case or suspected COVID-19. No history of attending large gatherings associated with COVID-19 outbreak. And for the patients recovered from COVID-19 infection for 30 days, again for 30 days after discharge. So this type of patients we can classify as low risk. But we, we also have to know uh, what type, uh, what is the classified of medium classifications. Person under investigations or PUI, a patient who has one of the following symptoms, such as difficulty breathing, cough or sore throat, with and without fever, and has a history of traveling overseas within 14 days, prior to having symptoms or having close contact within 14 days uh, prior to having symptoms with COVID-19 positive patients or if the patient attending events, gathering where participants are positive for COVID-19, yeah? Uh, it has happened. Uh, it has happened in Malaysia, I forgot. Uh, in the month of February, we have a family gathering in Petaling, in a mosque gathering, and some of them having symptoms have uh, COVID-19, so become shocking for all of us. And another is person under surveillance. surveillance. These individuals returning from overseas and required to undergo quarantine for 14 days. There may, may be no sign or symptoms, but they are suspected to be infected. And patients recovered from COVID-19 infection, but less than 30 days after discharge or experience sign and symptoms within 30 days after discharge can be classified as medium risk. 
uh, as for high risk should be confirmed positive COVID-19 by, of course, by lab investigations. We could not uh, suspect. Then we come to the um, airflow. As I told you, I give more uh, emphasis in airflow and air circulation, especially in my place. Uh, upper image is out of standard. They use an air, air condition system, you see. However, the exhaust fan and ventilations are almost non-exist. Lower image is better, even excellent standard for pandemic. Um, why? Since they use natural air circulations by making larger the exhaust fan and ventilations. I took this image from CBS News, July 13, 2020. It is said that Japan has long accepted COVID's airborne spread and scientists say ventilations is key. Yeah, again, ventilations is key. Now this, okay, no, after that, yeah. And it is uh, some study, uh, study about transport of aerosol from a nursing stations and the aerosol less than 3.0 micrometer um, consisting virus and most airborne bacteria were found to be capable of migrating 14.5 meter from a general patient room to an airborne infectious isolation room, uh, enter room entrance in less than 40 minutes at concentrations two to five times greater than the ambient. I mean, greater than the uh, air around those places. They can migrate. This study uh, done by University of Nebraska, 2015, uh, USA. Yeah, in USA. And then another study uh, already done in London about airborne infection in a fully air conditioned hospital. It has happened in three hospitals in London in 1975. Um, sorry, it is, it is not my intention to give an already old literature uh, to you, but at least we know if this case already happened long time ago. And in 19, around 1989 in Surabaya, Indonesia, it is my city, actually. Frankly, it is my city in Surabaya, Indonesia. There was a hospital that is quite looks equipped with air condition. Then there was yellow fever outbreak at the hospital. I think probably due to lack of air and uh, to lack of air change due to all doors and windows tightly closed. But unfortunately, uh, there was no publication about this yet. I remember that time all journalists or like that could not expose this, but uh, eventually the hospital was closed. And actually, respiratory viruses are transmitted in multiple ways. A, by contact trans transmissions, is infection spread through direct contact with an infectious person, such as touching, 
during a handshake, so we could not nicely handshake everybody yeah, nowadays, or with an article or surface that has become contaminated. This, the latest uh, article, contamination with this, uh, it is called vomit transmission. And B, droplet transmissions is infection spread through exposure to virus containing respiratory droplets, uh, including larger and smaller droplets and particles exhaled by an infectious person. Transmissions is most likely to occur when someone is close to the infectious persons, generally within about six feet. And another C uh, type of uh, transmitted can be airborne transmissions. It is infection spread through exposure to those virus containing respiratory droplets comprised of smaller droplets and particles that can remain suspended in the air over long distances, um, usually greater uh, than six feet. So um, maybe in Malaysia, we always mention meter, maybe around two meter in time, typically hours. Um, because of the above conditions, as I uh, shared to you, many companies offer EO suctions. It means extra oral suction. But all of us, especially oral physician, dentists should be aware that the field of dentistry usually is indeed a field for the sale of equipment as well as materials. Maybe this EO suction they offer to every school in any country, I believe, not only this, many times. So I will not discuss more about this any further. Then we come to a building design. As I told you, I used the closest a place, it is my office, office, yeah. Uh, this is our office, Faculty of Dentistry, Ames University or FOD, yeah. It consists of four floors. Yeah, you see, all rooms are under one roof, which includes a ground floor here, you see, ground floor, maybe very little consisting of a lecture hall, material rooms or warehouse, and receptions. And nowadays, during this pandemic, we use as triage room, yeah? this ground floor. And for the first, this is first floor. And second floor, this is first floor and second floors, Mm, our clinics, clinics, we have clinics also. Yeah, of course, clinic. Maybe only the dental school have a clinic here, yeah? Because uh, medical school should be go to other uh, building, hospital. Uh, clinics and third floor here, third floor is lecture room. Lecture room in third floor. Sim lab. Here, sim lab. Meeting and briefing rooms also here, around here. Yeah. Maybe so far, but at, at least you can imagine. And this all is fully air conditioned. But there is advantages of this FOD building, which is that although fully air conditioned, but also provided Ventilations, oh, this is clinic, sorry, this is our clinics, yeah? Fully with air conditions, and can you see, all is tightly closed, door and window, yeah? And yes, as I told you, there are advantages of this building, which is that although fully air conditioned, 
but also provided ventilations that can be open and closed on every floor. This is this is door in each floor we have like that from ground until third floor. This is door and this is after door, go down stair, yeah, go down to stair and there is a window. This window and doors can be open. Yeah, actually can be open. But unfortunately, until this time, the door and window were never open. It, it is open, hiddenly I open. Why? Because I want to make this presentation, but every day never be open. But I can understand maybe because it's fully air conditioned and it's been on the plan since before the pandemic. Then uh, it is from outside our building, yeah? Again, FUD, come from this place, go to left side, enter to the building, and uh, it's a picture of a ventilations window from the side of FOD. Actually, at the back side, there is also a ventilation window. A similar, uh, similar picture, but on the back side. This is on the side. Mm, but you see, this is clinic. This is clinic. But in the clinic, there is no ventilations and there is no connections and no ventilation. So no connections with the this room, building room. Even we are rich with uh, ventilations. Yeah. So I come to the suggestion. Yeah. So you can uh, this is side and other also have uh, back side also have like that. Then I come to the suggestions. Number one, we need to redo. Our building need to redo or recheck a good airflow or air circulation setting again. I mean, check and recheck the setting again, redo the mini. And therefore, it is necessary to open and close the ventilations that is already available at least during working hours, business hours. Um, before pandemic maybe was not indispensable, not too necessary, but uh, now this we should do this. Suggestions, only suggestions. And uh, I propose the additions of X house pipe in clinic with, of course, with minimum price. So I will explain to you. So I write explain not to make me uh, forget. Uh, there is a layout attached here. So number three, yeah? Okay. This is uh, a completely layout of the building from the ground floor to the third floor. Okay. Uh, to make it easier to understand. Uh, you see, this is clinic, as I told you, this is first floor and second floor. You see, there is no connection with this ventilation and no exhaust fan at all. So what I propose, uh, propose this is an additional exhaust pipe that I propose to enter to the clinic area in the first and second floor. I'm not sure what, what kind of material because uh, I'm not familiar with the architect or occupational health. I do not know, but 
it is my sincere belief we still can get uh, the lowest price for this for our safety and again as far as i know there is no exhaust fan in clinic uh, in order not to make uh, the aerosol that are mixed with other gas or solutions we can make a uh, We can place a container is here containing sanitizer at the ground floor. What kind of sanitizer is it? up to the institutions, of course. This I gave a chlorine sanitizer is the uh, cheapest way. Why I suggest to make this? Since uh it is not or uh, it is in order not to make the aerosol that are mixed with other gas or solutions comes out to the building so it means we spread the infection we spread the anything outside to the building by giving this uh to accommodate the container containing sanitizer then I hope it can be safe for not only for us in dentistry, but also the environment outside the dentistry. Then we back to the suggestion number four. Actually, we do not know if this pandemic will exist until when, whether five to eight months as it is now or a year two years or even more, I hope not like that. Then, of course, it needs more serious treatment. Okay, then as a conclusion, I would like to say, based on this review, it is concluded that the evaluations of actions, constant research, the integrations and commitment of the professionals are fundamental for the improvement of good practices in oral health. Access to information and knowledge sharing are the best tools for changing behavior and attitudes. And attitudes. There is a set of strategic alternatives and specific preventive improvements to be planned and executed before, during, and after care based on information that has emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic. And at last maybe, okay. Uh, there is several critical questions and I believe I could not uh, answer or discuss right now. Uh, so you can take as a take home message I hope if you want to make a discussion with me, furthermore, most welcome. I will give you uh, my email number. So the take home message is how effective are mitigation efforts to prevent SARS-CoV-2 spread, especially ventilations and masking? And what proportions of SARS-CoV-2 infections are acquired through airborne transmissions? And what are the conditions that facilitate airborne transmissions? And what is the infectious dose for SARS-CoV-2, uh, such as many, how many variants are required for infection to occur? And do inoculum size and route of inoculations affect risk of infection and disease activity? Thank you for your most attention. And actually, for this study, I prepare around 24 or 25 yeah, literature review. Maybe you feel you need more no, not only from my uh, my uh, my uh, lecture or like that. No, you can find by this reference. Okay. Okay. 24. Uh, thank you so much for your most attention uh, then i gave this time 
again to the moderator, Dr. Susana. Yes, thank you, Dr. Widawati. I, I really appreciate learning from you today. It's been my pleasure and my honor to be the moderator for your session. We're okay. already getting some fantastic questions from the audience, so this is great news. The first question I wanna share with you actually has to do with an urgent dentist's case. Let's assume the patient will be needing general anesthesia. Is there specific preparing of that patient before they meet with the dentist? Assume that all of their comorbidities are already well regulated. Also, the patient needs uh, general anesthesia, yeah? Actually, uh, patient when come to us, as you know, we make a screening like that. When she mentions, uh, she or he mentioned that he have some uh, disease, anomaly or deviations like that, of course, we try to postpone this meantime. Of course, we try to postpone this meantime. We have to avoid these dangerous conditions, but at least we have to consult with the medical experts with a doctor yeah general doctor we could not do uh, directly make a general anesthesia and make operate it and even before this uh, occasion be, be, before this pandemic it has happened in malaysia uh, a patient died maybe uh, other patient died because of general anesthesia why because we want to extract it that too, because many, many complications in general anesthesia. So uh, not so easy we make like this uh, decision. We have to consult with our uh, colleagues in medical point of view. Yep. Thank you. I hope this question can be. Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's uh, a team of people that take care of these patients, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to, to reach out to people who are in other portions of the medical profession to be able to get those answers that you need. This is great news. I have more questions coming in on the chat box. We have another fantastic question for you. Can you please elaborate on the handling of infectious waste from dental surgery? Okay. Actually, in dental surgery, frankly, many infectious waste in dental surgery. Uh, simply, if the patient don't have a disease. But on the room, we, should, we have also infectious organisms, infectious with, uh, in, not, not with, infectious organisms, but become more and more uh, dangerous when we combine with our working, usually using drill, uh, handpiece. Uh, to drill the patients, so become move and the aerosol comes out to everywhere. This is we could not, frankly, we could not control. So many uh, dangerous microorganisms, either virus or bacteria. About bacteria or virus, uh, um, so far till now, what we are afraid is about COVID, of course, and other ways, uh, other ways, maybe before this pandemic, we don't feel so much. So we close all because you, we use uh, uh, fully air conditions. But after this pandemic, then we think that many uh, uh, ways, and if you ask what kind of ways, many, many microflora, dangerous microflora, Either, especially virus, of course, because we don't have any drug for the virus. Okay, but I could not mention one by one. Oh, can be TB, uh, can be lactobacilli, can be any any microorganisms. Okay, I hope uh, it can be understand. Yeah, with the. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got another really good question. And it comes from somebody who works inside the black zone of COVID-19. Wow. And in their situation, their clinic is inside a fully closed building. The windows do not open. 
Uh, there is full air conditioning, but they're looking for a suggestion as to how to improve those conditions. They don't have a budget to make any major modifications to the building, adding, say for instance, that, that pipe that you speak of. Is, is there anything realistically that they could do about the, the aerosol risk in their environment? Mm. In, sorry, in your place, I mean in that uh, questions uh, in that persons, they said is black zone and always all fully closed windows and almost impossible yeah, to make a budget for modifying the building. So if like that, for the meantime, I says, suggest you to open, to open all doors and windows. How can you make a good environment if you close, close the ventilation and doors. So we need air much more comparing with use uh, air condition. I understand air, air condition in uh, Indonesia, in our country, it has become a luxury hospital, but actually we have better using natural airflow, uh, natural air by opening up window and uh, door, of course, because you could not make any, even though uh, if you make, uh, like I suggestion, I make you uh, circulation like that, using pipe like that, actually not expensive, but I do not know uh, whether your office can effort or not like that. It is not expensive, but can be safe for all of us. Okay. Okay, hopefully they can open as many of those windows as possible and they're not yes. permanently shut. Uh, I have another question related to airflow and it states, is there any special vacuum or suction to collect all of the waste coming out of the oral cavity? You, I, you showed us a machine yes, um, yes. That, that draws the air from above a patient while you're working on them. Yep. Um, says, because we do have several uh, equipment in our, pieces of equipment in our clinic, uh, I guess that could prevent cross-infection from patients to staff mm -hmm. or even the other way around. So in, is there anything else that you can think of in addition to that machine that you, sh you showed in your slideshow uh, mm -hmm. that could help to remove some of those fluids or mm -hmm. aerosols? Um, this is in the it's a complete okay. Mm. That extra oral, I mean, uh, extra oral suction. Uh, I I told you, I, I show you in the uh, in the slides. I think it is only intention to the patient only to suck all the aerosol that comes out from the patients and uh, around around not more than one meter. Only that close place and of course they sell many many with HEPA filter with this 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 but actually not enough you should uh, um, give an addition of pipe clinic as I told you with I do not know about price maybe you can effort but it is frankly it is not enough if we use extra oral uh, suction and you know extra oral suction become so popular in any clinic in this cell but what happened you know I know in Indonesia many in Indonesia many dentists and doctors still die because of COVID uh, I do not know what what happened but at least we can try to give uh, um, ex house pipe like not should be similar with my uh, my idea, but you can uh, make a modified uh, modifications. Huh? You make a modification of Albert. Uh, beside to open the ventilation, you can give also. If impossible to open, you can give the like that. Um, yes, give that pipe that I proposed, <laughs> but uh, that type you can uh, imagine, you can modify it by yourself, I think. Yeah. 
Okay, so the feeling that I get is that there's a lot of pieces of equipment that might help, but none of them are going to protect the dental professional or the patient well enough that you would not need to use personal protective equipment and do all of the cleaning that you do. That's still going to be necessary. You're not going to be able to get away from that. Yeah. So very important. Yes. That's very time consuming to be cleaning like that and yeah. preparing the patient yes. like that. Yes. Which, yes. which uh, kind of brings us to the next question from uh, our YouTube audience. How many patients are you treating in the clinic per day? It, uh, has it changed pandemic? because of COVID-19? Yes, of course. Because we are... Uh, um, Hospital clinic, yeah. Uh, no, no, hospital. Uh, no, I mean, not hospital clinic. Uh, learning clinic. We are learning clinic, so we have not to not to protect only us as a lecturer, but we have to protect also students, uh, dental staff assistants. So we make a limitations not by counting counting the total uh, patients, but actually we already have a notes, big notes, that many patients want to be treated in our clinic. Then that patients we give most, uh, most time. Number one, we will offer service for that person who have already uh, registered long time before this, maybe three or four months before the pandemic. But new patients, we could not. Nowadays in our clinic, we could not uh, treat it. So we, so we didn't uh, count, oh, today five patients, tomorrow one patient, not like that. But based on the patient who come to our place, but we gave more specific in the previous patients, not new patients. Okay. Thank you. I continue Thank you. to write your questions in the chat box while you're all writing questions for Dr. Widowati. I have one of my own for you. Okay. Okay. So you. over here in my experience, some dental professionals require the patient to rinse their mouth with an oral antiseptic solution yep. before their procedure. Yes. Is that something that you would recommend and do you think it would be helpful with COVID-19? Mm, I think maybe the direct effect not so uh, can can be clear, can give effect, oh, we can become more stand uh, with the COVID-19. But at least why? Because we are afraid with the uh, cross transmission, cross infections, yeah? We can keep from other infection that come within this, maybe uh, not pandemic only, within this rainy season. Within this rainy season, uh, within this rainy seasons, many virus like influenza also come and uh, stomach disease. So we still continue the uh, mouthwash, of course, can be better for patients, but it does not mean <laughs> uh, we can free uh, free from the contaminations of uh, COVID. But fortunate, uh, fortunately, uh, until this time, we don't have any case in our uh, school, in our dental school, even though only dental school who invite patients, not medical school, not other schools here. But so far, we can prevent that uh, conditions. Well, that sounds good. I'm, I'm glad that I have uh, actually had that done several times as a dental procedure and that it does actually yes, help yes. with okay. some of the routine things that we see. But again, we go back to this theme that with COVID, there's no one thing that's going to provide protection for the dental professionals and the patients. Yes. It's a combination exactly. of factors. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm hearing you say that there are a number of people who uh, are going to have to wait for dental treatment because yes. you can't see as many patients yes. right now. Yes. You're turning some of them away. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, in addition to that, with COVID-19, we've seen a number of people have long lasting effects. So some people have apparently gotten a chronic injury that perhaps they have difficulty with hearing or memory. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people who lost their sense of smell, they don't get it back or they don't yeah. get it all the way back, mm -hmm. which means that they cannot taste properly as well. Okay. And so all of those things uh, would have uh, an effect on a, a person's quality of life. Yeah. I would think that they maybe wouldn't take yeah. as good care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would suffer from depression mm -hmm. and, and, and not be taking care of the oral cavity or other things yeah. about their health. Yes. Do you feel that there will be a large number of serious dental disease cases following COVID-19 because of some of these things, should we prepare for that? Yeah, yes, I think sure, because they have to wait uh, a lot, uh, long time to treat it their uh, case. For example, someone who have pain because of, because of endodontic case, very pain. We can give painkiller, for example, but we should makes open drill to comes out the gas inside the pulp, dental pulp. So uh, myself, if there is my um, colleagues want to do to treat this type of patients again, because there is, we could not use uh, high speed or drill, please try to use another manual, and then we call it as a reamers or files. So with hand instrument again, with hand, no need to use a machine so can make aerosol. So we use instrument with reamers or files. And of course, patient feel pain, we can give local NSTC only. Why? This is only the relief of pain. The only way to relief of pain have to open the pulp. If we can work with um, high speed burst and drill, it is easy, but we could not. So please give anesthesia and we can give local uh, manual with reamers or files with hand, not with machine. This is my suggestions. And after that, we can prescribe, of course, analgetic. This is as a general dentist. As a general dentist, I told you as a general dentist. So this condition can be uh, stand maybe after relief of pain, maybe can be stand around only seven to 10 days. So we have to make another appointment, but with the expert, endodontics expert. So before that time, during waited time, I can uh, consult to endodontist or like that and refer to them, not I treat by myself because I am not in the dentist. This is for example. <laughs> okay. Right, uh, and I see that someone has uh, commented on our discussion about using an antiseptic oral solution. Uh, in their case, uh, they've mentioned the use of povidone, uh, mm -hmm. 2% for, for 30 seconds, uh, a gargle with that. Yes, as, as an option for, for uh, reducing the oh, yeah. infectious. Okay, yeah, we have to try yes. many, many. <laughs> uh, for example, not like this, uh, as, as, as you know, in the COVID patients, sometimes they have diarrhea. So what can we do with diarrhea? Maybe here only Lomotil, Damotil, only for diarrhea, not for, not for COVID. And in the dental point of view, we can give like, Povidone iodine, iodine, and then maybe someone have an asthmatic or uh, difficulties in breath. Uh, we can give here asthma fan or uh, inhaler, inhaler with um, um, uh, salbutamol. It, it is not my mind, but as far as I know. Con salbutamol containing inhaler, we can give to the patient, we can prescribe. Why? To reduce the, the symptom. 
the symptom we try to reduce, even if they have a high temperature, fever, maybe we can give uh, um, paracetamol, yeah, Panadol, but it is not actually not the treatment. Have to be follow up, yeah. Till now, I think there is no drug, not a single drug can be treated the uh, COVID-19. So today I speak more in a uh, COVID-19, but actually <laughs> regarding biosecurity, yeah. <laughs> but okay, okay. So far, yeah. I can answer. Yeah, I will. Have. Absolutely. Okay. And I notice we don't have any more people typing their questions into the chat box. With your sure. permission, okay. uh, in case someone is having trouble with the chat box function, with your permission, would you like to open up the microphone and let people unmute and ask you a question directly? Okay, sure. Welcome. Okay. Okay. So our audience, if we have anyone who would like to speak their question right now, we'll give you a, a, a moment here to do so. Dr. Widawati, everybody appears to be very shy this evening. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or at least morning your time, um, evening my I time. Some, uh, some uh, participants, even from Japan, uh, welcome. <laughs> if you want <Hello>. to ask. <laughs> so while we are waiting, I was curious about one more thing. Okay. Some of the rooms that you showed, it okay. looks like you might be able to provide treatment to several people at the same time. That's very common here. Dental clinics will be working on three or four patients, yes, yes. but the rooms are not truly separate from one another. Uh, yes. So do you need to stagger those patients so that you're not working on two people in the same airspace at the same time? Before the, this pandemic time, yeah. In one room, we do uh, until five, even four and five uh, patients uh, in the room because students do with this and we, but nowadays uh, we have a special, not we have, we make uh, previous room, we make not we, uh, previous room, we make special only for one case. So they should, the doctors or the students that want to uh, treat that case have to consult with the, of course, with the lecturer. And we make a schedule for this uh, uh, place. We have two rooms for that. And every day, maybe we can do uh, until three or four patients, but not in one room. So they have to queue. Then they have to uh, register first before either students or the doctors. So we can do one by one, but uh, in a queue. For, for example, this time, this person, this time, this person, like that. Okay. Which also reduces the number of people that you can help these days. So there'll be a lot of people to take care of once this virus resolves. Yeah. Because we'll be catching up on a, a lot of things we weren't able to do yeah. right now. So yeah. it's going to be a very busy time for you both ways. Right yeah. now, you're very busy cleaning in between patients and yeah, yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. about extra infection control. Uh, yes. And later, you may have to reopen those rooms to several patients yes. at once uh -huh. to catch yeah. up. Okay, most possible because our school make a guideline, you see. Our leaders make a guideline, but we do not know until how long this guideline. Should be renew, renew every year, every month or what? We could not because like that, <laughs> movable conditions, yeah? So I think yeah. uh, guideline could not be long time, <laughs> especially you know, this time. <laughs> no one seems to know what's going to happen next or what how long that will take yes so yes. that's the unfortunate truth but we're all in it together and i appreciate you being a part of the answer today and helping <laughs> us all out 
I, I know that we've uh, run out of questions here in our chat Hello. box. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, so it's I, perfect. Okay. <laughs> I guess this is, uh, I'm Andrawan. I'm from Tokyo Medical and Dental University. Okay, good morning, uh, Dr. Andrawan. Good morning, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, explanations. I just want to ask you uh, about general questions regarding the uh, pandemic and the people awareness. So how do you think, because we are in Japan, uh, basically people are really uh, strict and disciplined about the, the condition itself, the pandemic itself. And what about uh, the patients and also the people in general in Malaysia? Do they really aware of this uh, pandemic? Do they take care of themselves really uh, in a uh, you know, uh, very strict manner? So uh, I guess it is, it is, uh, it is also the, one of the factors that uh, can reduce this kind of you know, the pandemic, the, the spread of this pandemic. And so how, how do you think? Is there uh, any idea of how to let people know mm. in general uh, yes thank you okay thank you for your nice questions uh, frankly to say to you actually in Malaysia from government they are very very aware of this uh, condition aware and they put even policy between the state they put police between the state if we want to move to other state. Maybe even now we could not move to other state. I could not move the, to KL because KL a red zone. But here, especially in Sungai Petani, not red zone. And we could not go there nicely like that. So this is one uh, effort from the uh, government. Uh, government. Uh, but, however, uh, from the people, not everybody can understand uh, these conditions. It is difficult. I think maybe almost similar with America. Sorry for telling that. that. You see, they don't want to use mask. They would, oh, no need mask because we need only God can help me. Ah, like that type of person we still uh, have in Malaysia, we still have. They don't want to use uh, masks, especially in the market. You know, our market is crowded of persons and you, we could not uh, keep the distance, but they don't want to use uh, masks. It is a problem for us. So, uh, sometimes we suggest everybody use this and if you go by car, if you have to go to the market, yeah, I mean, yeah, a wet market, then you come back, of course you feel uneasy to your car. You can try using uh, to spread with antiseptic or sanitizer to your car. At least we try like that, even to our room. We give sometimes our own sanitizer we can make by ourselves so we give spread like that because we come from the clinic, for example, or for example, we come from the students because students come from everywhere. But nowadays, not, not come from everywhere. All students already uh, here, living here in the dormitory. So we no need to last uh, so afraid like that. Uh, it is my sincere belief that <laughs> Japan has no like that <laughs> conditions, yeah? Everybody can understand using uh, a mask every day, but uh, not in, uh, in Malaysia, and especially not in Indonesia also. Sorry, my friend from Indonesia. Hmm? I think like that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, welcome. He brings up a good point, Dr. Widawati. You had mentioned this before, that a uh, lot of, of the processes that you go through in taking care of patients really rely on the 
cooperative nature of your patient. They have to work with you to yes. make these these practices really work out. And yes. if they're combative and they don't want to cooperate, mm. that makes it a lot more difficult. And I yes. think I think dental professionals are familiar with patients who aren't cooperating very much because it tends to be a very scary and sometimes painful process for them to go through. So sometimes they don't want to cooperate. Are you noticing that people are not cooperating with some of the COVID-19 protocols you have in place? Um, Yeah, yes, frankly, yes. Sometimes they, even they ask, what are you doing in dental? Why you are so care about COVID? You didn't treat COVID patients. And they, they mentioned like that. You even not treated uh, COVID patients. Why is you so care, so care about that? And then I have to explain, oh, this is aerosol, this is like that. You, so impossible. Ah, dentists have no job regarding with COVID. Ah, this is, can, uh, <laughs> the condition can, <laughs> okay. Very frustrating. Uh, frustrating. So, <laughs> yes. So we had a, a person from our YouTube audience yeah. ask the question, are, are all of the patients screened by a doctor before they go through a medical procedure? Or is most of this that you're doing uh, sort of questionnaire based? Or are you waiting for the patient to volunteer that they have a, a comorbidity or some other kind of condition? Mm. Actually, uh, on a triage place, we place uh, some persons, yeah? even not a doctor, but at least one doctor should be uh, standby over there. So uh, dental uh, assistants, DSA, dental staff assistants, or anybody can be there by learning that. And always at least one or two doctors ready over there. Why? Uh, sometimes they have uh, some questions. Hey, doctor, what we should do like that? And then we give. Uh, so not if every time, because we are not enough uh, persons also. Not every doctor should be ready in uh, triage. No. Only one or two doctors ready there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had good success opening up the microphone. Does anyone else want to unmute their microphone to ask a question? It has gotten very quiet again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Thank you everyone for the questions that you asked. Obviously you're all very engaged and very concerned about COVID-19. And uh, as Dr. Widowati mentioned, we are still learning new things about it every day and we are getting better uh, at prevention and treatment. So yes, so everyone continue to learn, ask questions. Dr. Widowati has given you a long list of 24 things you can read. Yes. to find out more. And mm-hmm. she has also offered uh, to be in contact with you later if you think yes. of questions after okay. this session. So okay. thank you so much, Dr. Widawati. I appreciate awesome. your time. It was okay. an honor to be with you. Thank this you, Dr. Susanna. Morning, your time. This evening, my time. Okay, okay, okay. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. I, okay. I'm going to turn everything back over to the MC. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Widawati, thank you very okay. much for a wonderful talk. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ms. Susan, for moderating this session. Okay. Sorry, I will give my uh, email here. So if uh, somebody want to contact or want to discuss, most welcome. Yeah, I gave to this uh, section, uh, to this chat room. Okay. All right. Okay. So it was a very great session today. And, oh, on thank behalf, you. and on behalf of the organizing team, we would like to thank all of you for attending our fifth program of Biosafety in okay. Biosafety Month, October. Okay. Okay. Before I say goodbye for this session, we'd like okay. to get feedback from all participants by scanning the code on the screen right now. We promise the evaluation survey will not take you more than one minute.
Your feedback will be greatly appreciated and you can either scan the QR code or go to the link shared on the chat box. After the completion of the survey, you would receive a participation certificate within short time. And I will keep this light running for about two minutes to scan the QR code. We will be looking forward for having you, all of you joining us again in the next session. We wish you good health and safety. I'll be back shortly and thank you very much. Thank you, Mudrita. Nice to meet you. Bye. Nice to meet you, Bube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Wan. I hope by now everyone had the chance to scan the QR code, so I'm going to end the meeting now. Stay safe and have a wonderful day. Hope to see you soon in the next webinar, and once again, thank you everybody.